So Kanban burgers from 18 months to three with Kanban and punctuation points. What is this all about? If, uh, actually, I'm, what I'm doing here is just telling my experience and my uh, experience with a particular implementation of Kanban at McDonald's Corporation. Okay. Uh, before we do that, let's uh, start with a, a quick introduction. My name is Rodrigo. Uh, I work as a senior manager for software architecture at RDI Software. I am a technology passionate. I am also a developer. So I, I say that I'm accidental manager because I never planned in my career to really be a manager. It just happened naturally. So I, I can say I've been working as a manager for the past five years. I still have a lot to learn and I'm still learning a lot every day. I've been working with Kanban since 2013. I'm also a KCP. Let's talk about RDI Software, the company I work for. RDI Software, uh, at RDI Software, we design, build, and support restaurant automation and e-commerce software for McDonald's. So our software currently runs on 37,000 restaurants, give or take. Uh, 36.9 last time, the last time I checked. And it processes approximately 53 grand per minute in customer transactions. So we're talking about $53,000 US dollars per minute flowing through our system throughout the world. Uh, a little bit of background and history of, about our relationship with McDonald's. RDI software historically has been, uh, was a wholly owned subsidiary of McDonald's Corporation. But uh, last year, McDonald's decided to offshore all the IT operations, so we were actually acquired by Capgemini. So we are now a Capgemini company since August last year. However, we continue to be strategic partner for McDonald's Corporation around the globe. We are pretty much dedicated to them. Okay. Uh, also, RDI is based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but we are all around the globe. Okay, that context set. I, I said in the title of my presentation here, from 18 months to three with Kanban and punctuation points. By this time, I assume everybody here knows what Kanban is, so I will talk about punctuation points only. So what is a punctuation point? The, the first time I heard that term on this context was actually from David J. Anderson himself during my KCP master class in Brazil. And I, I immediately recognized my, this particular case with uh, punctuation points. Punctuation points, though, they are those key moments that disrupt the equilibrium of a company. And that can be quite good for us as common coaches specifically. Uh, because equilibrium is resistant to change. So if your company is running in slow and steady mode, you know, cruise control mode, and everything is just okay, it's gonna be very hard, very difficult for you to try to introduce chains, even if those are chains for the better, right? So uh, a punctuation point makes it easy to insert chains at the organizational level. Uh, the funny thing is that uh, punctuation points are typically very bad situations. So I added a couple of examples here from David himself. Financial crisis, regulatory changes, political changes, merger, acquisition, etc. Those are the kind of bad situations that disrupt the equilibrium of the company. But uh, you need to learn how to leverage those in your favor in order to introduce change for the better. So uh, what I'll do here is I'll do some storytelling. And I warn you, I'm not good at that. So please <laughs> be patient. Uh, this is the storytelling of how we achieved a six-fold improvement in time to market in a particular project. Shall we begin? Once upon a time, in a company far, far away, where waterfalls were all around, a punctuation point was born. Okay, I told you I'm bad at this, so I'll not torture you anymore. I'll stop the storytelling part of it here. But this can give us some good context about where this story begins. So the year is 2012. Uh, we are running in a moment of equilibrium at RDI Software and McDonald's. So we are cruise control mode, right? Slow and steady, just OK. And uh, we are running, of course, our software development, development business 
with waterfalls. So uh, typical traditional waterfall development methodologies and methods. And a punctuation point was born at that time. The first punctuation point in our story actually came from McDonald's himself. That was the beginning of our journey to Kanban. So what happened is that at that time, we were experiencing um, time to market of around 18 months. That was actually the best case scenario. So 18 months from the conception of an idea until that idea was implemented in the software and delivered to a McDonald's restaurant. And McDonald's came to the conclusion that this time to market was not good. It was going to potentially jeopardize their dominant position in the market because they realized that competition was getting closer and closer and they needed to innovate, right? And if you, you cannot innovate with a best case time to market of 18 months. And they came to us and said, okay, you have long periods of tests and stabilizations due to bad software quality. You need to fix that. Right, so that, that was our first punctuation point of bad customer feedback. We're uh, risking our business at the moment, right? So we received the mission to solve that. And to be honest, at RDI, we knew that they were right, that we had very long uh, uh, test periods and stabilization periods, but we also knew that was just a small slice of the problem because we have all this uh, end-to-end -end uh, thing that they were not, uh, they were overseeing. So uh, we did what we could with our slice of software development, right? So we actually, I won't go into the details here, but after many discussions, we designed a new software architecture. And I was given the mission at that time, I was a senior architect. I was given the mission to, to go to management level, or given the opportunity to go to management level and start leading that new initiative. So, uh, Okay, that, that's new to me, but let's try, right? That's why I said uh, this is, uh, I'm an accidental manager. So that new software architecture was designed to improve our time to market. So it, I want to, won't go into the details about it here, but it was based on microservices, test automation from the beginning, etc. all the cool stuff you can imagine. So it was a greenfield project. You know what a greenfield project is, right? So when you, Look ahead and all you can see is that beautiful green grass and you can build whatever you want on top of it. This beautiful green grass with probably a couple of butterflies flying around and unicorns in the background. That was my project. So uh, probably that's the dream of everybody in the software industry to, to have the opportunity to lead such a greenfield project. But more important than the project itself, this was my opportunity to introduce new processes and tools. Right, so we need to we need to go agile. Okay, so what did I do? I brought Scrum, and uh, please don't take me bad. I'm not Scrum hater at all. It's uh, we started the project with Scrum per my own proposal because uh, this is January 2013. Scrum is all on the hype. That was actually almost. Sign, uh, the same as Agile, right? <laughs> so that was the only thing I knew at the moment. And we, I didn't really know Scrum very well, but uh, I was given the mission and I started it. The first sprints, they were, I would say, a bit awkward. I don't know how to better describe the situation, but we were making progress. Why we were feeling a bit awkward? Uh, there was this general consensus and, and feedback from both the team and uh, everyone else, I would say, that something was off. We didn't have like numbers or metrics or anything to, to prove that, but uh, a couple of facts. Uh, we were spending a lot of time on ceremonies. So we did, we, we studied uh, Scrum and we did all the stuff, right? So we were doing poker planning sessions, etc. And okay, that was working, but we were feeling that we were spending too much time on ceremonies and too little time on actually doing stuff, right? Uh, another thing that was really bothering me and the team was that in our first sprint of the project, we were working overnight. Why? Because we committed to deliver some scope and we need to deliver that scope, right? So first sprint, we are working overnight for 
I don't know, three days in a row, and okay, we, we managed to make it. Then came the second sprint, and we finished the whole scope in half of the time, and now we had idle capacity in the team. And I said, what? Something's wrong here. I, I, I don't know what's wrong, because I was working overnight last week, and now I have idle capacity in my team. What's happening? Uh, I'm pretty sure there's someone much better than me to implement Scrum. I don't think that's the point here, but I knew that I needed to change something. And what I identified, that's again, 2013, okay, so don't judge me, is that Scrum was not bad at all. It's just that Scrum had this learning curve, uh, and it's quite a steep learning curve. And we needed to uh, have proper turning, learning and um, survive that learning curve. And we didn't have time to do that because it was such a high visibility and high stakes project. So I discussed all those issues with my director and he suggested me to try Kanban at the time. Okay, so I didn't know anything about Kanban other than the Scrum Kanban board. And what is this? So I did what anyone in my position would do is I went home, I opened Google, and I learned everything I could about Kanban in a single night to come on the next day with the solution, right? So that's what I did. Kanban it was. Actually, we started very simple with Kanban. We, we, we had this team meeting and talked to everybody and everybody agreed that we had some issues to be solved. And so everyone, everybody was willing to try something different. And we started with what we had, and we didn't really change anything in the process. We just put the physical Kanban board and started the pool system. That was it. After a couple of months just doing that without really doing any whip limits or anything other than that, we had very good, visibly better team satisfaction, I would say. We could quickly identify our bottlenecks in the process, and the perception of the flow is that the flow had improved a little, even though we didn't have metrics yet to, to measure it. And it was funny because we didn't do anything in the process, but we were already seeing some improvement even on the flow just by visualizing our bottlenecks, right? Our bottlenecks at the time were typically on the testing, right, between development and testing, etc. Just by visualizing it and making it explicit to everybody, uh, without changing anything in the process, we, are, or we were already seeing some benefits. So after this, uh, I don't know, beginning, we decided to give proper Kanban training to the whole team, myself included. That's when we called actually our colleague here, Rodrigo Yoshima, an IKT very famous in Brazil, and uh, he, he was our Kanban trainer uh, for, for the whole team. So we did the KMP1 module for the whole team, and after the training, it became much, much clearer that we were in the right direction, but we definitely needed a few important Kaizens. So Kaizen in Kanban is that culture of uh, doing very small continuous improvements, right? And now we had the, the enough knowledge to understand that we needed to do those Kaizens. Okay, so we, in the first two Kaizens that we implemented, the first two small changes were pretty straightforward because we didn't change anything in the process at all. We just uh, changed the stuff around it, right? So, uh, the first one may be a little bit controversial, or a lot controversial, I'd say, is that we implemented a digital board. So we were using a, a physical Kanban board by the time, which I believe it's great and works for most of the projects, but for our particular scenario, we had two problems with the physical board. The first one was that because of company policies, we needed to have Jira tickets anyway. You can't even do a git commit if you, if you don't have your Jira ticket assigned to you. So what happens is that we're, we're spending time keeping the digital copy and the physical version of the cards aligned, right? And that's, that's not good. And the second problem, I think that's the most important one. This created two sources of truth. You should never have two sources of truth. You should, should always have a single source of truth. So that's why we took the decision to eliminate the physical board and move to a digital board. We were using Jira, so we moved it to Jira Agile. And I am not a big fan of Jira Agile. I know all its limitations. It's certainly not the best tool you can have, but 
it worked for, for, our, for our case, it worked. The second Kaizen was uh, that we realized that the Kanban was so much oriented in flow, right? So focus on the flow and we had absolutely no way to measure our um, flow efficiency of the team. So what we did is that we changed our zero workflows to map those uh, cues that are quite invisible typically in a zero workflow. So we added what we call the waiting columns here. So you can see quite badly, but you can see here uh, so a couple of examples here. Waiting for review would be the waiting for code review, uh, waiting for test is, well, waiting for test. So uh, by just doing that, we allowed ourselves to now track our uh, flow efficiency, right? And this is a particular cho personal choice, I would say, the waiting for, because if you, if you look on how the community is doing or search for it in, on Google, you will find multiple different ways to track those queue columns. You will find, for example, ready for or uh, development ready, things like that. I particularly chose waiting for because this creates this good psychological effect that this is a bad column. You should never have a lot of stuff on that column, right? The next Kaizen's, I just selected a couple here to talk about because there, there were literally uh, many of them. Uh, the next Kaizen's required some level of process adjustment, but nothing drastic. The first one, uh, actually this is in no particular order at all, I don't remember which order we implemented those, but we were able to move from a periodic replenishment and refine it to a just-in-time replenishment refine. So what we did is that uh, we already had this daily stand-up meeting, the, the gate daily uh, Kanban review meeting. We, we eliminated completely the periodic uh, cadence of doing replenishment and during the daily review meeting, the team leader for that particular project would just check, okay, now that my to-do column, which is my replenishment column here, is too empty, I need to trigger a replenishment. We also introduced this refining process of when you're moving something from your big backlog or call it pool of ideas, call it whatever you want, when you are committing to do work, uh, you need to be very sure about the size of the work, right? So what we did is during the process of committing to do work, we also refined it. So if the team leader was not satisfied or was not comfortable with the size of the card, he would call a specialist and schedule a meeting or do whatever to refine it and potentially break it down into multiple ones. We, uh, the second one's great because uh, we were still operating with QA as a separated team by the time. And after months of talking and talking on every opportunity that I had, uh, I, I was finally able to influence the leadership to uh, break down the QA, separated development and QA teams into a, what we, we call today a development QA. So uh, we spread out all the quality assurance uh, analysts throughout the development teams, and now we are finally able to have inside our development team a quality assurance analyst that would do our, quality, our testing, quality control, quality assurance, and test automation as part of the whole process, right? Before that, we had this big wall here between development and QA, and development uh, would just create stuff and throw up around the wall and wait to see what's gonna happen, right? Potentially weeks or months later. Uh, and we also obviously implemented the WIP limits. And with WIP limits, we decided to implement, implement cross-function swarming. Because when you do proper WIP limits, there's two things that can happen typically. You can generate some idle capacity, which is sometimes very good because you need some slack for innovation, you need some slack for uh, introducing new ideas, etc. But we, you can also try to use that idle capacity somehow. And that's, that's how we decided to, to go for it. So uh, we did training for the developers so that they also could do test automation, for example. So when we had a bottleneck in our QA column, right, waiting for testing, developers would swarm and actually help on that. Okay, so this is pretty basic Kanban stuff, right? The first results with only those chains were quite okay, they're, they're good. 
So our average lead time reduced from 23 days to 8. So that's massive. Defects reduced by 80%. That's also massive, but uh, need to be caref careful here because we also did a lot of investments, some very heavy investment in test automation, right? So this is new architecture together with new processes, test automation, etc. Average follow efficiency was 50% of the time. I don't have any ways to compare how it was before because we didn't have any ways to measure it before, but I know 50% was already very good because we do have market benchmarks that say that average companies are around 15%, right? So anything above 15, I was uh, satisfied and we got 50. Uh, we still didn't have any measurable improvements in the throughput though. And this is particularly interesting because this means that we were not delivering more stuff. We were actually still delivering the same amount of stuff that we were before. What we were doing is that we were delivering better stuff. We we're delivering more value with that same quantity. So that was good, right? Uh, but that was still at the team level. You, uh, probably most of you were in the class session where he was think, talking about this end-to-end -end thing, right? So we're not end-to-end, -end. we're still at the team level. So we, we had very little impact on the uh, time to market because we squeezed development and improved development, but development was probably 10% of our time to market, right? Then came our second punctuation point. That was the key. So that was our opportunity to really go agile. The second punctuation point was also caused or was also generated by our customer, McDonald's, because they were designing a new business concept for restaurant operations. And our software is what drives the restaurant operations. So they were heavily dependent on our software to, to, to model that, right? So, but the thing is, they, they were so uncertain about whether it was gonna work or not, that they needed to experiment. They knew that if they just tried to implement everything at once, and it, it, would, it would fail, right? So they came to us and requested this, hey, we need, we need a way to, for this particular project to be much better than the 18 months of time to market. They need something to experiment and have very quick feedback back loops, right? Okay, so for that particular initiative, McDonald's agreed to go fully agile. And we implemented a dedicated service delivery Kanban that was end-to-end -end from the intake to delivery with direct customer participation in the intake. So that was a completely new story. That's going to the next level of uh, getting the benefits uh, from Kanban. So what happened was our customer, McDonald's, they were free to reprioritize stuff, add stuff, or remove stuff from the backlog or for, from the pool of ideas at will. They could go crazy and reprioritize the stuff twice a day or 10 times a day. We didn't care. That wouldn't affect anything beyond that, right? So the only rule was after our commitment point, right? After we committed to deliver something that we were actively working on it, they wouldn't change anything at all. So that was, how can I say, a whole new experience. So when we did that, uh, the customer was very happy because the experience they had before without the end-to-end -end service delivery Kanban is that any prioritization would probably cause a two months, three months delay in our software delivery, right? So now they could reprioritize the stuff twice a day, 10 times a day, I don't care. As long as they're messing on their own column in our Kanban board, that wouldn't affect us at all. Uh, we were also very happy because uh, now they, could, they had this little playground that they could just go crazy over there and we were not being affected. Before that, any, any reprioritization was, okay, now let's, let's see what we can do to, to accommodate this change, right? So we were very happy to have this explicit rule, okay, after this point, you don't, you don't touch anything, right? Uh, so after we implemented that, uh, we saw different levels of results, especially when we talk about time to market, right? So that was a whole new experience. Uh, we had 21 features designed, 
implemented and deployed within an 80-month period. So one year and a half, 21 features may seem a little bit small, but we're talking about the two, uh, two developers team, three developers at one point in time. So it was a very small team. And we were able to fulfill this need from, for experimentation for the business, right? Our average time to market for that particular initiative was now three months. That generated some very good feedback to the business because they could experiment something, gather feedback from the real world, from the real restaurant, and then go back to the drawing table and, and propose new ideas, right? And uh, the 18 months that we had before was actually best case, as I mentioned. The three months was, was average. So we had a couple of very small features that were requested, so small enhancements that they wanted to test very quickly. And they, come, they came to us and said, hey, we know this is small. Can you please prioritize this and say, okay, let's put this in our expedite lane and let's prioritize it. For those items that we expedited, we saw between three and four weeks of time to market. So we were actually talking about something that was unimaginable before doing this end-to-end -end service delivery Kanban. The funny part here is that this quick feedback loop, uh, from my perspective, was a huge success from a Kanban implementation perspective, from a software development perspective, and it allowed the business to understand that the idea was bad. So the business concept, it actually failed. So this, this is not a story of success from a business concept perspective. Uh, they, they tested and they tried to modify the business concept a couple of times, and they just ended up completely redesigning the idea because they, they understood that this was not going to work. It was costing them too much money, kitchen equipment, etc. So there were multiple business reasons that are completely outside of the software development life cycle that made this project fail. But uh, I think this is the beauty of Agile, right? Agile is designed to make you fail fast. So that's, that's what happened. They, it allowed them to try, experiment, and try to modify it and get, gather feedback loops and, and then potentially even fail or completely redesign the idea. But from my perspective, that was a very good case of Kanban implementation with very good results from the software development and from the Kanban point of view. So in the end, we live it happily ever after. Right. So, uh, no, that's, that's not true, actually. So, uh, that project was very successful. I think this is a very good case for, for my experience, but we're still not there yet. Um, we're still not there yet because we still have a lot to do to implement this company-wide. It's, it's McDonald's, so you know the, the size of this company. We're very successful at implementing this and a particular initiative. But we're quite far away from being able to achieve this for all products, for all teams, and et cetera. But uh, hopefully, we will actually get there, right? So actually, that was uh, everything I had to say. Let's just do some quick recap here about this story, right? So. Everything started in this moment of equilibrium. RDI software and McDonald's are running cruise control mode, waterfall development. It was not bad, but it was not good. But our first punctuation point came. This new software architecture was designed, Greenfield project, right? So let's take this opportunity from a Greenfield project to introduce not only a new project, but also new processes and tools. Then came Scrum, and per my own suggestion, we tried Scrum for a couple of months, then for multiple reasons decided to move to Kanban. Multiple Kaizens after, we were seeing very good results at the team level, but we were still not there yet from, uh, I mean, flight levels, right? We're not flight level number three yet, so we're probably flight level number one. Then came our second punctuation point. That was the need for experimentation from the customer itself. That's where really things got to the next level because we implemented this end-to-end -end service delivery Kanban 
and saw 18 months of time to market being reduced to three. Um, after the first punctuation point on item uh, number four here, right after all the Kaizens, we had improved a lot in our teen level. But to be honest, we were still seeing 18 months of time to market because we improved a lot in 10% of the flow, right? So that's, that's, that's where the, the benefits are coming from when you go to the next level. So I think this is a very good case of uh, successful implementation. In a particular context, of course, there, the, that was a team without interdependencies, so it was a much simpler implementation. But the business outcomes were quite, quite high. Okay. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this case that I brought.